Hey everybody, welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. This is Craig Garber and we're with a very handsome, successful young man today with Norm Harris from Norman's Rare Guitars out in LA. He needs no introduction. I know you know him if you're listening to this show. I just want to give a shout out and say thank you very much to our mutual friend, the amazing Dave Amato, who's not only a really nice guy, but one of the best guitarists out there. Uh, so thank you, man. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So already you're starting to lie. You're handsome and young. There's two <laughs> things right there. Pretty much. Which one was a know, lie? <laughs> uh, both of them. <laughs> uh, I, so Norm wrote a book here, right? Confessions of a Vintage Guitar Dealer. Excellent book. So that's going to be the platform for some of our questions. I'd encourage you to go read it. It was super interesting. Uh, a lot of things about him that you probably wouldn't know. And how he built his business was pretty fascinating. So I want to talk about that. Uh, that's the thing I bet people don't understand the most. So I want to get into that. You, you mentioned in the book that you were a, you know, quite a partier as a kid living in Miami. Yet for some reason, when you moved out to L.A., uh, which was originally to further your music career, all of a sudden you bought, you bought 50 to 60 instruments with you. Not like three or four, 50 to 60 as a security blanket. And yes. in, in spite of all that partying, you had a really good level of awareness and foresight to do that. And I was just curious, what, what prompted that? Like, where did that come from? Well, I had uh, a band in Miami and we were, you know, relatively successful locally. And we had two guitar players, um, both played guitar and bass. Neither one of them had a bass. So I went out and I said, you know what, I'll buy a bass. In the meantime, you know, maybe I'll, you know, try to learn how to play. And, and in the meantime, you guys can switch off on the instruments. Uh, one of the guitar players was Bobby Caldwell, who's had a lot of uh, success at sure. tune, What You Won't Do For Love and a lot of other, uh, you know, hit tunes and stuff like that. So um, they both had, uh, uh, you know, they had guitars, but one of them had an old ES-335. And, you know, uh, the other guitar player's name was Bob Jabo, J-A-B-O. And uh, so he had this 335 and he would always make such a fuss over it and go, wow, feel the neck on this, you know. And we, one time we were in a music store, he says, feel the neck on the new ones. How about my guitar? You know, and he kind of pointed out some of the things that were so cool about his old guitar. So um, it, that was kind of a just a circumstance that I had no control over that just kind of, you know, weighed in on me. I went, wow, you know, maybe they're not making guitars quite like they used to. And um, I was an early riser and I'm also a hard worker. And so um, I thought maybe I could pick up a few extra bucks by just buying and selling some guitars, finding them in the newspaper or going to pawn shops or, you know, I mean, a lot of people just were not hip to old guitars back then. This was about 68, 1968. Right. Uh, so I, I realized that, you know, some of these things were really cool. And once I realized what the differences were, I was able to buy them. And there was a very, very small group of people that appreciated what the old guitars were. And there was no store that kind of specialized in any of that. And, and what was it that, what was the, the sort of like the final straw, if there was one that pushed you from pursuing your musical career to like, you know, there, you're very passionate about this and you have to be because it's a really difficult job. Well, I love what I do and yeah. it's plan B, but the final straw was food. I mean, you know, we were, you know, we were struggling and, you know, I, and also I've been married for 53 years. And uh, so Congratulations. I That's had, really cool. thank you. So I had a responsibility that the other guys didn't have, you know, so I had to look out, you know, for my wife and we wanted to start a family and that kind of thing. So I couldn't just put all my eggs in one basket and just hope to win the lottery. So, uh, and these other things were tangible. I mean, you know, I, I had, you know, when I looked at an old guitar, I could, you know, point out what's great about it. But with my music, I was always my own worst critic, you know, and I could kind of, you know, if I was going to hand somebody a tape or, or something of, of my stuff, I would kind of do it. And I would kind of go, you know, this is really great, you know, but I, I didn't feel like I was being totally truthful. Right. But with the guitars, I was. I knew what was great. I could 
point a guitar out to you and say, this is a great guitar. And I wouldn't be lying with my music. I felt like I was always lying. Right. So I get you. Uh, one of the things that I find really amazing is pe people often see a successful business, right? And they don't really have any clue what's involved in birthing the business and then getting it up and running. For example, on, on the surface, I think the average person probably wa walks by your store and just figured, wow, this guy opened the store. He was just in the right place at the right time, which is a little naive. And so uh, one of the things you just mentioned was your work ethic. And that's one of the things I was most impressed with in reading your book. And not just, you know, the intensity of your drive, but, you know, all the different ways that, that you went about creating the velocity you needed to get that business lifted, you know, like an airplane, get it up and running off the yeah. ground. I mean, you, you really hustled your ass off to build that business. I, I did, but you know, um, I would always say to anybody, if you can find a job that you love, it makes it so much easier because you don't mind getting up in the morning and hustling and doing what you have to do. Um, it's uh, so much easier than if you hated it and you had to get up and drag yourself to work and all that. So if you can find something that you really like and you try to learn everything about it, you know, don't forget back in the day, there wasn't the internet. And right. there weren't all these books about guitars and all that kind of stuff. So um, I had to learn from players and whoever, um, you know, could tell me something about these guitars. There was an old man in uh, uh, Miami. His name was Mr. Black. And he was this <laughs> old guy and he did guitar repair. And I would bring some things to him uh, to have repaired. And he was uh, an old geezer when I was young. And I would, you know, always go, you know, tell me, uh, you know, about the S-335 or tell me about this Martin D-28 or, you know, stuff like that. And um, I tried to milk him for all the knowledge I could because there really was nobody that was, um, you know, willing to uh, or had the knowledge to kind of spread around. And a lot of people just didn't think it was anything in terms of vintage guitars and that kind of stuff so it was uh it was a very inside kind of thing and there were a few players around town that kind of recognized it and one of them was Jaco Pastorius who was a friend of mine and um I played in this band it was called Katmandu and Jaco had a band called Woodchuck and we played in some of the same places as a double bill and um and of course People know about about him. He's probably the greatest bass player that ever lived, um, and he, you know, also had a love for the old guitars and old basses and that kind of thing. So uh, we had like a little inside crew of people that dug this stuff. But to most people, it was like we were speaking a foreign language. Yeah, but I mean, the, the things you did, like get you know, you getting up at three or four in the morning to drive two or three hours away to find a guitar or getting up on a Sunday morning at 4 a.m. to go to a swap meet or paying some paying the guy that delivers the papers to get you the paper first. So, I mean, I know what you're saying as far as if you like your job, most people don't go to that lens. Yeah. They're well, not willing I mean, to hustle like that. Right. Well, you know, a lot of it was I, I consider it almost like prospecting, especially yeah. back then, because it was you never knew what might be. You know, if there was any gold in the uh, in the water there, you know, yeah. so um, it was exciting. You know, I mean, when you, you know, there would be like newspaper ads and it would just say something like old Gibson guitar or Gibson guitar <laughs> uh, or Fender guitar or Martin guitar. Um, there was one thing that uh, I ended up buying a guitar that um, it was in the uh, Miami Herald. And it was under garage sales and uh, or miscellaneous for sale. I don't even know if they called them garage sales at that point. And it said something like couch, refrigerator, stove, uh, guitar, whatever. And there was a phone number. So I called and I asked this uh, lady, I said, uh, what kind of guitar is it? And I didn't know a lot about guitars at this point, you know, so um, I was kind of really trying to learn. And she said, well, it's a uh, Gibson. I said, oh, really? I said, um, can you tell me about it? What are you asking for it? She went $25. And I went, uh, well, I'll tell you what, 
make it 20 and I'll come over there and buy it regardless of what it is, you know, figuring it was like an LGO or something that was destroyed or, you know, I figured I'd probably have to have somebody work on it or whatever. So I go over to this lady's house and she opens the door and there's a beautiful brown case leaning against the wall. Now, I don't know anything about what I'm looking at, but you look at this case and the case was beautiful and I'm going, well, that couldn't possibly be it. You know, there must be some other ragged guitar. So oh no, that's it. Uh, we're moving to Japan. My husband's business is causing him to relocate there. So he told me to get rid of everything. So um, she opens the case and it's a blonde cutaway L5. Now, you know, I, you know, I know nothing about guitars, but right. the case alone is worth more than 20 was, bucks. Uh, yeah. yeah. Even back then, and, you know, don't forget, you know, this was in the late sixties. So the prices were way different, you sure. know? So, uh, but when I looked at the guitar, I'm going, I know I got something here. And I kind of went to some of, uh, the local people there was a guy named ed olick who was also before he had a store was buying and selling a few guitars just as used guitars and i don't even know if the term vintage was even applicable at that point i think it right. was more just a used guitar but i knew i had something and i took it to a couple places and this one friend of mine said man you have no idea what you have and that kind of really got me going you know so yeah. you know some dumb luck and you know that that always helps you know when you know something like that happens yeah and you go well maybe there is something here maybe i should be getting up at 5 36 in the morning and getting the newspaper early and hell yeah and, you know checking all this stuff so um it was you know it was a great experience and it also kind of gave me the energy to go out and start you know chasing guitars and all that so you're like a kid on Christmas morning on these trips, basically. That was exactly what it yeah, was. You know, I mean, cool. I didn't have a lot of money, but I had a little money stash. Yeah. And, um, you know, and it didn't take a lot because, I mean, back in those days, probably the most expensive guitar. I mean, I Sunburst Les Paul, when I first started buying and selling guitars, was about 800 bucks. Wow. And people were complaining. They were going, 800 bucks. Are you crazy? You know what you could buy for 800 bucks? <laughs> you know, is used guitar, 800 bucks, you're out of your mind. And, um, you know, of course, you know what they go for now. I mean, yeah. you know, one in pieces is probably 150,000 bucks <laughs> or something, you know. So, right. um, but, you know, at the time, you know, a few thousand dollars went a long way. You could buy yeah. a lot of guitars for that. That's so cool. What I know you said um, that, you know, your motivation was you had a family and you're just being responsible and doing the right thing. But where do you, where do you think your drive comes from? Because that's. Uh, I think that's my dad. I mean, my dad was a uh, Russian immigrant and um, he escaped. His whole family was killed in a, a, a battle that they had there. He was from like Crimea, that area, Black Sea. Oh, area. wow. Yeah. And uh, so his family and he, his family was um, they were educated. They were art collectors. His father um, had uh, a fleet of like fishing uh, boats, you know, that went out. And, you know, so they were kind of upper middle class and they ended up, the whole family got killed. They ended up with nothing. My dad escaped on a freighter, came to America with nothing, didn't speak English, uh, but he heard that America was a land of opportunity and went to Ellis Island, which, you know, there are yeah, a lot of stories. All the like immigrants, that. yeah. And uh, he ended up, learning to buy and sell actually to fix sewing machines and after world war ii he went to japan and he got the rights for brother sewing machines so he was the president of brother sewing machine but he was you know he was a very very hard worker and i mean there were no he didn't go by a time clock or anything like that right. i mean you know he'd get up and he'd get going and if there was an opportunity he'd be doing it at one in the morning and if not you know then he would get his rest you know so but he was an example to me that you know there's nothing that replaces hard work mm -hmm. i mean i've been very lucky in a lot of instances where things have fallen my way but i think the harder you work sometimes the luckier you get yeah i totally agree with you man and and if you don't work hard nothing falls in your lap that's for sure right. Yeah, right. man. I, I mean, unless you. you inherit money and, you know, just uh, 
spend it for the rest of your life. But I, you know, I, I always wanted to do something. I wanted to do something that was kind of my own. And, um, you know, when, when I came out to California, I was married already and all that. And we were living in a house. Uh, and my band was uh, managed by Little Richard's brother, Peyton Penniman. <laughs> and so we're living in a house uh, in Sherman Oaks, no furniture, eating out of tin pans, you know, Eagle <laughs> Army Navy store sure. tin pans. And we were sleeping on water beds and, you know, we had one old TV and, you know, we we're driving a crappy car and all that. And uh, so um, when we came out, all the guys were sleeping till like 12, one o'clock and then getting up and it, there were more night birds and all that. And I was up at like six o'clock in the morning looking for guitars because I yeah. had kind of established that I could make a couple bucks by doing that. Yeah. That's so cool, man. I, that's, I have so much respect for you for that because I know how hard it is. It, every, I think everything that you do is hard. I mean, I don't think anything is, you know, is a gift. But, you know, if you like it enough and you're willing to put the time in, again, I think that's what really matters. And it was also a time of opportunity. Um, now, you know, doing this, it would take a lot more money to, uh, you know, the, the numbers are so different now yeah, than yeah. they were then. Let me ask you this, though. You... This is, I'm curious about, you said a couple of times already, I think if you're doing something you like, right. where did that come from? Because your dad didn't take that job, presumably, because he liked it. He took right. it because it was an opportunity. And there is a huge difference. There is. I mean, yeah. my dad liked what he did, but he wasn't passionate about it. But right. he was just the example of working hard. Right. And um, just showed me that, you know, you could come to America without speaking the language, not having family or friends, money, anything, you know, the clothes on your back. And, you know, if you work hard, there are people that may recognize that and give you a little break. And then, you know, from there, it's up to you to kind of take it and find your own path. Yeah. You're fortunate, though, because a lot of people, when they grow up with, without somebody, you know, encouraging them, hey, do what you like, they don't know any better. Well, my dad yeah. died when I was 16. Oh. So this is before I bought any guitars. Uh, so, um, but it was, and he used to always think I wasn't listening to him when uh, he spoke, you know, but I really was. And yeah. a lot of the things that he said really rang true. So um, I was grateful that I was able to, uh, you know, to do that. Yeah, that is great. And, and towards the end of your book, you make a comment. You said, my joy is in the buying. This is, was so sweet. My joy is in the buying. No matter how many times I see a case opened to reveal an unseen, an unseen guitar, I still get a blast of adrenaline. Absolutely. It, just talk about, just, I mean, you kind of mentioned, but well, elaborate on that. It's really. It's like prospecting. It's, uh, you know, like let's make a deal or something, you know, there's five boxes, which one do you choose, you know, <laughs> and you don't know whether you got the Zonk or you got the, uh, you know, the prize. Right. And so um, it's just the surprise element of it is fantastic. What you were just talking about, a great example that you talked about in your book in 1988, you and your friend, Chris, went to the Arlington Convention Center for a mm -hmm. guitar show. Mm -hmm. You wind up buying a 67 custom Fender Lake Placid Blue Telecaster in mint condition. There was a series of very unlikely and unusual events that led up to that transaction. And in this particular Absolutely. case, yeah, you said something like, if I hadn't have had that second cup of coffee, or if you hadn't lost the, you know, the odds or evens game, you and Chris play to see who chooses what right. you know that wouldn't have happened i was curious how you look at events like that that have played out over your life like do you look at it as luck or i don't know if you're spiritual or like karma or just the fruits of your uh, labor or well i think i'm all of the above but especially luck i mean you know dumb luck always <laughs> you know i mean <laughs> it's just being in the right place at the right time but chris uh had a guitar store in london and I did a lot of business with him. And so we were at the hotel and we were walking towards the show. And this guy um, gets out of his car and he's got two Fender guitar cases. And he said, are, are you Norm? I said, yeah. He said, um, yeah, I've got a couple things for sale. And I said, well, what do you have? And he's got like a brown Fender bass case. 
that was in really nice shape and a black kind of nondescript case. So um, Chris and I flipped the coin and he won. And I said, all right, which one do you want? He says, I'll take the brown case. So the brown case was uh, like an early 60s precision base that was stripped on uh, the finish was stripped down and it was uh, just a natural finish. The neck was original finish and the parts were right and all that. But the other case was a Telecaster custom Lake Placid Blue with binding with hang tags. It was a 65 or six, I think it was a 66. But I mean, he looked at me and he went, you mother, you know, <laughs> that, was, that was your choice, pal, you know? Yeah. And it was just like stuff like that, you know, happens to you and you just go, I don't know why. And he, he couldn't stop talking. He said, you are the luckiest mother, you know? And he was just, uh, you know, he couldn't get over the fact that he yeah. won and he lost at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you've opened thousands and thousands of cases. I mean, statistically, oh, yeah. that's going to happen. The more cases you open, right. the more times right. like things like that are going to happen, man. But I I've, have to say that I've been especially lucky in some cases. You know, one thing that my wife kind of, um, you know, encouraged me to do, we used to go down to the Musicians Union here in L.A. Right. And they had a bulletin board and they also had a musician's handbook that listed every musician that was there by what instruments they played and all that. And she said, you know, why don't you get like the handbook, look up who plays guitars and just start calling some of these older guys. And sometimes you could tell by the name that they were old, you know, or right. that they were, you know, uh, you know, could be elmer or it could be a tex or whatever you know sure and you know so you'd read through and you know you start calling and i would go you know i collect guitars and uh you know i'm interested in any older gibson fender martin red frickenbecker or d'angelico anything like that that you would have and i found some unbelievable stuff by doing that and that was uh through my wife's suggestion yeah and there was one where uh there was a guy who um, he worked at a TV station in Hollywood and I called him and I said, you know, I'm a collector. Do you have any older Gibson Fender? And, you know, and he said, well, I have a, an old Stratocaster. And I said, really? I said, well, what would you want for it? And I think it was maybe about $1,200, which was a lot. I said, what color is it? He said, white with a dark neck dark you know so i figured it was kind of white with a dark fingerboard and um so anyhow at the time this was a little bit later on where the values had already started climbing up and all that but um i go to the tv station he walks me out to the parking lot and he opens up the trunk and there's a tweed case so right away i kind of go okay this is <laughs> promising you know you get that he flips yeah. the case open and it's a 58 strat in um it was desert sand finish which is kind of a tan color like what the music masters and duosonics would be you know that you would see with a, an anodized pick card metal guard mm -hmm. and an all rosewood neck so it was like the first all mm. rosewood neck i mean you know the, like the rosewood telecasters later on that were sure. all rosewood so it wasn't just the fingerboard it was all rosewood and I looked at it and I went, you know, what is this? I've never seen anything. He said, well, I had a TV show called California Hayride and I was friends with Leo Fender. And I said, could you make something that would look good or different on TV? So, I mean, that was complete dumb luck. Although, yeah. you know, there were a lot of other guitars that I saw in between time that were not quite that but it just happened to be at the right place at the right time and um you know again he just thought it was just something cool that leo made for him but it was a real historic guitar and i ended up selling it for a lot of money years down the road and um you know I, and i love this stuff a lot of the time i didn't want to even sell things because yeah. i fell in love with it so much but i had to sell things in order to have money to go out and buy some others sure so that's kind of the to drag about being in business if you don't want to just stop and end and you're done you know you have to figure out how am i going to support this uh you know this thing so 
well, the way too that you called them and you said, "Hey, I collect guitars." You didn't say, "I buy and sell guitars." Because when you said right. collect, no, you, that would kind of put people off. And totally. Sometimes, um, you know, you wouldn't get a guitar if you did right. that. And and I did collect guitars, so I wasn't completely lying to them. But I also bought and sold them as well. Yeah. yeah. So and uh, you know sometimes I would get up at like you know five in the morning and I would go down to the Greyhound bus station in L.A. because I we had followed the newspaper trucks yeah. from the Daily News, which was the Valley San Fernando Valley paper or the uh, L.A. Times. We'd go and watch as the trucks left with the papers and where they dropped the first papers off. And it was a Greyhound bus station downtown. And it was scary. This would yeah. be like, you know, 530 in the morning. It was dark outside and there were all kinds of crazies out there. But I was like the first to get the paper. And then I would call people up and it would be like, you know, maybe by six at this time. And people would go at six o'clock in the morning. What are you calling me? You know, and I would go, well, I had to lie. I said, well, I'm going to work today and I right. have some cash with me and I'd love to buy your guitar. Is, is it OK if I come over? And, you know, I was kind of persuasive and I would say probably 85 percent of the time they said, ah, all right, come on over. And and it was a field day because, I mean, you know, there was. You know, there weren't all these like classified section papers and stuff. There was a classified section in the Daily News and the LA Times, but there wasn't like the penny saver kind of papers or, you know, nifty nickel or whatever they call them, uh, you know, that were dedicated to that. So, um, you know, the Sunday Times was you know, a smorgasbord of, of good stuff. And I got a lot of great stuff out of there in the beginning. It's just some, you know, I hope people listening, he, how much time this is involved. This is not like, you know, oh, I, you know, did a couple hours a day here and there. You know, this is like serious oh, yeah. freaking work intensive, man. But that's Absolutely. why, you, but that's why you're doing, that's why this happened. Right. Well, you know, you know and I love it. And, um, you know, again, we went down to the newspaper, uh, the plant where the papers are coming yeah. hot off the printing press and i'm in the back watching all these trucks loading up and so we followed trucks until we found out where the the first drop off was that's awesome so, you know you got to be a little creative you know my wife here here's a crazy one my wife said you know cowboys play guitar why don't you see why don't we put an ad guitar wanted under horses for sale wow and i went well that's pretty nutty she said try it, you know, you know, and see what happens. And we scored big. Yeah. I mean, you know, and it was, you know, I found old Martins. I found, you know, Gibsons. I found early P bass, you know, I mean, just all kinds of great stuff. It was kind of crazy, but it was experimental. We were just trying to see where we might source some other stuff. And it was, it turned out to be really great. So that was kind of goofy, but it worked out. That was the, uh, before the internet had split testing of ads and stuff like that. That's oh, basically yeah. well, what you were the doing. The newspaper you're almost testing. didn't want me. The newspaper almost said, well, this is horses for sale. You can't put a wanted. I said, well, I'm paying for it. What's the difference? Yeah. What I put in there, you know, as long as it's not offensive. So they let me do it. And it turned out to be a really good thing. So, you know, you kind of experiment. You got to, you know, you got to be creative. I mean, you know, if you just sit back and wait for things to fall in your lap, a lot of times it doesn't happen. Yeah. And by that time I was already, you know, gung ho and kind of going crazy with this. So um, it was one of those things where, you know, every time we came up with something, you know, calling, uh, you know, my band would play up and down the state. So the first thing I would do is I would go to the musicians union, like in Sacramento or something, get the handbook and call and say, listen, I'm thinking of moving to Sacramento. I wanted to just call some of the players and see, you know, what, what it's like up here. Are you working a lot? And this and that, and by the way, I collect guitars. Do you have any guitars that you might be selling? <laughs> And that's uh, awesome, man. Uh, that, that's such good hustle. I really, well, admire that. you know, you, you live and learn, you know, yeah. so, and we were learning all the way. I mean, really, I mean, I, you know, up until the point where the internet came out and there were all these guitar books, there wasn't information out there. Yeah. So I had to kind of teach myself, you know, and one thing that I was very fortunate at is I, uh, I was always interested in guitars that weren't modified. 
I mean, you know, not that I wouldn't buy a guitar that was modified, but what I was really aiming for were really good examples that hadn't been refinished and hadn't had the pickups changed and things like that. Turned out that those are the guitars that, you know, really were the most valuable. Most collectible, but at the yeah. Time, I didn't really, you know, know about that, but. You just I had a gut I feeling. Me. I did. I just yeah. said, you know, it's, you know, it's like if you take the Mona Lisa, somebody paints a prettier <laughs> dress on her, that doesn't make it worth more. It makes it worth less. So, yeah. You know, we wanted stuff that came from the factory that way. And because the Fender factory was out here and because Rickenbacker was out here and because all, you know, it was kind of the center of the music uh, universe. Um, just there were opportunities here that I wouldn't have gotten if I was in, you know, someplace in Montana or some, sure. you know, some other town, you know, so it was being in the right place at the right time, having the hustle and then kind of trying to be creative and coming up with some stuff that, that other people weren't thinking about. Well, you did a hell of a good job at it, man. Well, <laughs> well, I, I was going to tell you one other thing. Like, yeah, you know, ahead, one, one, one thing that uh, I also was very lucky is that this is where they make a lot of movies. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. This is great. Um, so when a lot of the times these movies were looking for things so that they could keep uh, the scenes real, they wanted instruments from time periods. You know, there were a lot of movies that were made where they didn't think, oh, guitar players, they're not going to know the difference if we put a new guitar in. But, you know, it's like seeing a movie set in the 50s and all of a sudden a 1975 car comes driving yeah. along, that would throw you off. Totally. So eventually they became very interested in stuff from the right period. And I was the guy that was doing it. And uh, so... I got contacted by a lot of prop houses that wanted things for the movies. Um, the first one we did was uh, Bound for Glory, which was a Woody Guthrie story with David Carradine. And then we did Spinal Tap. And we did one called Streets of Fire. We did another one called For the Boys with Bette Midler. I mean, it was just all of a sudden it was like, you know, this takes place in the 40s. Do you have any guitars that look like these big band era guitars? Yeah, I do. You know, yeah. come look. And so we were almost a prop house at the same time too so that was very lucky what i thought was great in the book you talk about a story how they kept paying you to rent it and at one time you went over them say hey guys why don't you just buy this it'll be cheaper and they're like these big dumb companies with no accountability yeah. like no 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 let's right. just keep renting and you're like okay yeah well the guy the prop guy was a really nice guy this was uh in back to the future which i rented the uh guitar that michael j fox plays right. at es345 so um originally they wanted a guitar from around 1955 or 56. And um, I suggested a Gibson Switchmaster, which is an arch top with three pickups and a uh, four position switch that goes one, two, three, and all, you know, okay. three pickups and six knobs. It was, you know, pretty futuristic for 55, 56. Well, um, so the prop guy comes out. I rent him that uh, $300 a week. Right. You know, maybe about four or five weeks go by and they hadn't even made one shot of the guitar. And at the time the guitar was like 1400 bucks and the guys, uh, the prop guy's name was Terry. And I said, Terry, you know, why don't you just buy this thing, man? I mean, it's like, you know, it, you know, he said, nah, don't worry about it. They have a huge budget. They could care less, you know, go ahead and make some money. It's fine. You know? So the day that they go to do the first shoot, um, they open the case. And the art director on the movie goes, oh, no, 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 we can't use that guitar. It's got to have, you know, be a flashy color and have a whammy bar on it. <laughs> so I'm going, well, you know, that kind of changes things. So I showed him some Gretsch guitars and a couple of Fenders and things like that. Uh, and I had a 345, a red 345 with a Bigsby on there. And that was actually from around 1960. And I told him, I said, listen, you know, this guitar is going to be incorrect. You know, I mean, you know, for that period, they said, we'll take a few liberties. So they kept that guitar for, I don't know how long, $300 a week. And, and again, they could have bought that guitar for, right. you know, four or five weeks rental. Sure. And um, so they kept it. 
Um, they did the shoot. Then they eventually gave me back the guitar. And then they called me back a few weeks later and said, we have to do some touch-up shoots and stuff like that. So they read it for another like three weeks. It was like insane, you know? <laughs> and I ended up selling the guitar to a friend of mine who was from Miami, actually. His name is Richard Glick. And I sold it to him. I don't know. I don't remember. It was several thousand dollars because it was one in the movie. Now that guitar is a very valuable guitar because uh, a lot of people, that was their inspiration to get them into playing guitar. I think it is the biggest grossing movie maybe of all time or one of, you know, so um, it, it had a big impact. But, you know, it was just silly things like that you know it was not it was great that the guy was like he could have bought it himself and rented it himself but maybe that would have looked like a conflict of interest or sure something. that's cool so, right place right time yeah so he just said you know don't worry about it you know they'll be fine uh what tell me one or two strange requests or strange deals that you've done that you're like just why do you want this or some, you know whatever was weird okay well here's one um I was selling a lot of stuff to the hard rock cafes um, and um, you know, they ended up buying a lot of stuff and not for me, but they were buying like squires that were signed by Paul McCartney and stuff like that. And they really didn't know and they put them up and that was just a prop, but the stuff that I sold them was actually played and used by the artists. And I'd sold them loads of stuff and they knew that I was, you know, telling them the truth i mean i would say if the guitar if the guy didn't own the guitar i would say well he just used it for a couple of days or something you know i would tell him whatever it was sure. but you know that way you know i was covered and i wasn't you know kind of bullshitting with yeah him. so um i get a call from them one day and they go um you know we need something from frank sinatra and <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm feeling guitars, you know, it's a little out of my space, you know. And then I realized I have a friend named Jim Fox who played guitar with Frank Jr. And he was one of my customers. And I mentioned that. And he said, well, you know, I know uh, like Frank's assistant. I forgot what the guy's name was, but he was like his right hand man for years. And he explained you know, that we wanted some stuff. He didn't, we didn't say where it was going or anything like that. But, uh, and this was one of my dumber mistakes also, by the way, you know, I've made a lot of them. But um, so what, what ends up happening is he gets all this guy and the guy has some stuff that Frank had given him. One was a picture of a clown that Frank painted, signed and painted. There okay. was a microphone that was a gold microphone and it was um, in uh, etched in there, Frank Sinatra on okay. the mic. So I ended up selling that stuff to the Hard Rock and I think I sold it for about 20,000 bucks or something wow. like that. Who knows what that stuff would be worth now. But I mean, it, it kind of caught me so by surprise and I wanted to, um, you know, make good with the hard rock. Cause I mean, I've done a lot of business with them and here, here's another story. That's kind of crazy. Um, I have a buddy of mine who was a costume designer and um, one day um, I ended up doing a trade with Bob Dylan back in the day. <laughs> and he gave me this national electric guitar. It was like one of these white guitars, kind of map shaped, um, you know, national. And, um, and I had him sign it, you know, and, uh, and I had it pre-sold to the Hard Rack Cafe for $2,500. This was, okay. wow. this was probably 19, you know, or, you know, maybe late seventies or something like that, which that was a lot of money. Yeah. And, you know, I had never dealt with memorabilia or anything like that, that much. So, I mean, the prices were way different than they are now. There's now there's these options and stuff goes for a fortune. So it turns out that this friend of mine, his name was Don Vargas and he was like a costumer and uh, he worked on a lot of like the, uh, um, uh, you know, that uh, what's that in the bear, the, you know, um, Oh, Smokey uh, and the bear. Smokey and the Bear and what, yeah. um, Smokey and the Bandit. Reynolds. He worked yeah. on a Bandit. Yeah. He worked on a lot of these Burt Reynolds movies and stuff like that. And he was a costumer, and so I have the guitar in my store in the front of the store, and the case is open and it's signed Bob Dylan. And he walks in and uh, he goes, 
you got that from Bob? And I said, yeah. He goes, you know, I sold that to Bob. I said, oh, cool. He says, you know, that guitar was on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. And I didn't know that. Oh, you know, wow. I didn't even know there was any connection to anything. And so I called the Hard Rock, the guy that I was dealing with. And I said, look, you know, I told you 2,500 bucks. I'm not going to change my price on you. I said, I, I said it. I'm going to live by my word, but I got to be the stupidest person alive. Yeah. And they ended up sending me to New York and I went to the Hard Rock there. They put me up and they, you know, wined and dined me and did all kinds of stuff. And that gave them the uh, feeling that they could deal with me and count on me and to not go back on my word and stuff yeah. like that. So it, it, it really, uh, there was a time where I was probably the main supplier of uh, memorabilia to the Hard Rock. And so that little opportunity cost on that guitar was made up many, many times. Many, many times. As a result. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. They, that's good they did the right thing. Yeah. And I just, you know, I, I didn't want to, you know, go to a different price and have them go, uh, you know, we can't trust this guy, you know, you know, so, but th that really gave them the feeling that they could trust me and that I would be truthful with them and hold to my word. So I probably sold 500 instruments to them. Wow. Yeah. That's well worth a small yeah. price. Yeah. They're not, I mean, they're not buying much now because of the pandemic and all that. I think they really curtailed their, they were in like an expansion mode and they were like opening new places almost every month or two yeah. all over the world. And, um, you know, the, the guitars originally, there were two guys that owned the hard rock that owned the hard rack. And that was um, this guy, Isaac Tigret and Peter Morton. Yeah. And I knew them both. And uh, they opened their first uh, hard rock in London and they took a couple guitars that they had and they had like Eric Clapton and different people sign them and they put them on the wall. And um, they realized that that was kind of their niche, you know, was to, you know, have, you know, sign memorabilia all over the place. So um, eventually Peter and Isaac kind of parted ways. And so they would kind of choose one would take like Dallas, the other one would take Houston, one okay. would take San Francisco, one would take Los Angeles. And they had all these places that were um, owned separately by each. It was like almost two companies in one. And then eventually, I think the Seminole Indians now uh, have uh, the Hard Rocks. I think they bought the uh, the franchise. Oh, so, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Because I know they have a bunch of Hard Rocks casinos on Seminole property. I didn't realize they had bought the whole company. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so, one of the, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, no, no. So, I mean, I was just going to say that that little, you know, a couple little things led to me doing a lot of business with them. Yeah. And I think it's real important when you're in business that if you give your word, that you keep your word. It's some, yeah. Hell yeah. People respect that. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, all I have is my word. That's all we all have, man, when it comes down to yeah. it. Along those lines, good timing. This, uh, obviously one of the reasons you're successful is because you could read people. Well, you're in the, you're in as people of people can business can be. Uh, so you understand how to work yes. with them and how not to, what would you feel are the, the, uh, two two or three top skills that have helped you succeed in that area and maybe where did they come from well you know i think when you negotiate with people you know trying to buy um you know you don't want to insult them and tell them they're whatever they're selling is a piece of junk you may point out some things that um you know like for instance like on an es345 guitar they have a veritone and their stereo a lot of people might not want to um, deal with using a stereo cord. That's probably one of the reasons the S335 is more popular in a lot of ways than the 345. So, you know, you might point out that, you know, you know, a lot of people would prefer a 335. It's a very, the 345 you're selling is a very good guitar, but the 335 is actually worth more, which is true. Mm -hmm. But um, it was, and a lot of people just don't want to be bothered with hooking up a stereo cord because a lot of people don't really even, um, you know, do it the way it was intended. It was really intended so that you would have a split cord and from the right side, you would have your upper setting for your neck pickup. Uh, when you flip it down into the downside, you would have the other side for your um, bridge pickup. And then in the middle, they both come on. So you get the stereo effect. 
But a lot of people don't really want to be bothered with that. A lot of them don't want to carry two amps, or two speakers, you know, and that kind of thing. So the 335 is simpler and had more of a straight signal. So that's, um, you know, so when you're negotiating with people, you don't want to say, well, this thing's, you know, not very good, but you might point out, you know, a couple of things, you know, sometimes, you know, buy a Martin guitar, a lot of old Martins need a neck reset mm -hmm. because over the years with all the pressure of the strings, the neck angles kind of changes a little bit and um, the action becomes high and um, the way to uh, do it is that maybe heat press the neck to straighten it out, but you may have to uh, reset it, which is you heat it up it comes loose and then you shim it underneath to get the neck closer to the strings. So, you know, you, you might want to point out things that it might need, but without insulting them and telling them that their thing is a piece of crap, you know? Yeah, for sure. You know, well, I think it's just being gentle, but getting your point across and, and making a fair offer. I mean, you don't have to steal everything, you know, I mean, you know, but one, th one thing I will say is that I always like people to quote me a price first. Because you never know what somebody might say. Oh, that's the rule yeah. number one of negotiating, man. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> yeah, that's. But, I've had but, a couple of situations over the years where I made an offer that was so high into what they were thinking that they backed out of even selling it because they well, if it's worth that much, maybe I shouldn't even sell it. Uh, so, yeah. you know, the best thing is, is try to get them to give you a price and hopefully understanding you've got to buy it to resell it that it's going to be a price that leaves you some room leaves you some profit right right uh to whatever extent you're comfortable what were some low points or dark periods you've had to deal with in life and how did you get through them well i mean you know low points were you know i i came out really to be a musician and uh you know i you know how that is it's a very heartbreaking kind of business and i um you know that was really plan a up until maybe I opened this store, mm. uh, which was in 1975. So, um, you know, it's, uh, you start questioning yourself, well, am I wasting my time doing, playing music? And I always knew that there were people that were much better than I am. And uh, so I kind of felt, and I, and I had a, you know, a few really good bands and I played with some really good people, but you know, the fact that I had family and that uh, I have to be, realistic but you know it hurts when you know people you know don't respond the way you like to your music it's so personal yeah so the guitar thing to me really was a little less personal i can handle the criticism more um you know and then you know when i first started i was sort of like the renegade and there were all these big stores and i was the guy you know running around trying to buy guitars and kind of intercept a lot of stuff that might go to them and a lot of it they didn't even care about because you know they wanted new guitars primarily a lot of the stores but uh you know you just try to uh you know find whatever is working and kind of stay with that interesting that what you just said that you were kind of the renegade i could see that in what you're saying because you're here you are like you just said nobody's into vintage guitars or the term vintage didn't even exist and right. you're trying to make, you know, you're trying to basically make something happen, make, create something that doesn't even exist. Right. And that well, does I take would, a lot of uh, courage to keep pushing through that. Yeah. I would go to a lot of stores and I would say, do you have any used stuff that uh, came in? Can you show me some of the stuff that you took and trade and whatever, you know, and a lot of them were not even thinking about it, weren't that interested in the used stuff and all that. And then eventually, then they became hip to the fact that these things are valuable and all that. And it was a lot more difficult, you know, for you for buying from those out. guys. So uh, I give you a ton of credit for sticking that out, man. And hey, it worked. <laughs> yeah, I found like a little sliver of a niche that worked yeah. for me and I just kind of kept going with it. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, told me I was out of my mind and that you're paying this much for a used guitar and a new one is $400 and you're paying $1,200 for a used one. What are you crazy? Right. And I was like, yeah, I just happen to like it and I can afford it. And, you know, I'm just doing it. You know, what do you say to somebody who says something like that to, you know, keep them coming, keep selling. Right. Them, you know, so I'm a big dumbbell, you know, so some yeah. of all the cool vintage stuff you have Good for, that's really cool man uh musically 
Give me your top three Desert Island discs. No particular order, and just for right now. Well, I love the band. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think they're the greatest American band. Um, uh, that would probably be first. Also, I love a lot of the early Beatles stuff, you know, because you could kind of visualize the group playing as a group you know once it became sergeant pepper and all that it became like the philharmonic and it was so much going on you couldn't really you know visualize the guys but when they used to walk up to the microphone the two of them would sing harmony to like john singing lead or paul singing lead and the other guys you know there was just something about that and i i just always loved that and i was always like an r&b guy so i mean i love um you know a lot of the um uh, early Motown stuff and stacks, and then a lot of obscure R&B that a lot of people uh, don't know about. There was I... a guy actually in Miami who was like my idol. His name was Little Beaver. His name was Willie <laughs> Hale. And he was a right blues R&B guitar player. Um, he, I mean, he played on a lot of great music other than his own, and his own stuff was killer. And he was a great singer and a great guitar player. And I saw him play when I was in Miami and I was just like blown away. And I used to listen to a lot of the black radio stations back then. And so um, I became friends with one of the uh, disc jockeys down there. And, um, and I would go down there and uh, bring a bag of weed and we'd sit there and smoke weed, and, <laughs> you know, uh, listen to records and he'd take some of my requests and stuff like that. That's cool. You know, so, um, you know, so I, I love, uh, you know, the funny, funny thing is, is a lot of times, you know, the guys that work for me in my store, I've got some young people that work and they know who a lot of these other acts are. But for me, you know, I, you know, somebody go, Hey, you know who that is in the corner over there? That's the guy from Guns N' Roses or that's, you know, whatever. And I go, Oh, oh really? You know, so I'm, I'm friends with Slash, you know, sure. but I mean, you know, it would be, you know, that's Miles Kennedy or that, you know, it, whatever it would be, you know, and, um, you know, it wasn't something that I was aware of, but I, I always had somebody around the store who was like really good, who knew who some of the young artists were, you know, who kind of tapped me on the shoulder. Go talk to that guy. Yeah. That's cool. I just read this morning, Robbie Robertson just sold his catalog. Did he? Yes. Uh, I didn't know. Well, speaking of Robbie, um, I am uh, doing a documentary. Yeah, talk about that. Uh, well, actually, I'm not. My daughter decided to do uh, a documentary on the store, um, basically for her kids to see, just to let them know what their grandfather did and all that. And uh, so I told her, but listen, if you do the documentary, you can't start bothering my friends and customers and all that. And like a lot of daughters do, she goes, dad, shut up. I'm taking <laughs> care of it. Stay out of it. You know, so Robbie, uh, has done the documentary. We have Slash, Post Malone, Machine Gun Kelly, Vince Gill, Dave Amato, of course, um, mm -hmm. uh, Joe Bonamassa, Richie Sambora, Oriante. I mean, just on and on. Yeah. And there's probably about 35 names. There's also some actors too, like Jeff Daniels is a customer of mine, uh, Jeff Garland, Malcolm McDowell from, uh, you know, Clockwork, yeah. Orange. Clockwork Orange. I sure. mean, you know, so it's like, there's probably 35, 40 pretty famous people that have done the documentary. And, um, you know, so Robbie was one of the last ones. I think he may have been the last um, interview that we did. And they're, they're through filming it now, but now they're just trying to edit it down and then figuring out what to do with it and where to sell it. It's actually, there's a lot of cool stuff about it other than I buy my guitars at Norm's. It's not like a- What's, you know, the, what's the title of it? Does it have well, a working it's called title? the Norman's Rare Guitars documentary. I don't know if they'll change it. You know, I, I kind of think it should be sort of a small business story because it's, you know, it is a small business in comparison to a lot of these sure. you know, big chains and all that. And, you know, it just kind of, you know, talks about how I got started and, you know, uh, a lot of these people that how they found me and that kind of thing. And so, it's I, I and we do a lot of charity work. We've raised um, millions of dollars for this charity called the Midnight Mission. It's a homeless charity out here, and I'm really involved with them. And so there's a, a number of moments in the documentary where it's kind of 
a tearjerker in a lot of ways, you know, because I mean, you know, not everybody's been as lucky as I have. Sure. So uh, how did you get involved in that? Because you talk about that. in the book. Uh, you know, bit. one day uh, it was Christmas morning and I was um, watching the news and there was the midnight mission. They were handing out toys to a lot of these kids. And, you know, I just kind of said to myself, you know, um, I've been very lucky. L.A. has been really good to me. And, um, you know, maybe next year what I'll do is I'll buy a bunch of toys, rent a van, go down and just drop them off. And so I, I did that the following Christmas. I went down that Christmas morning and one of the guys from the Midnight Mission said, why don't you come in, park the van, we'll unload it and you hand out some of the toys to these kids. Well, I'm like a sensitive guy. I left, I was like in tears. And I said, what can I do to try to help these guys? So then I started thinking about it and I went, you know, maybe if I could put together some concerts and the money would go to the Midnight Mission, that would be real cool. So the first person I asked, and one of the greatest guys on the planet is Richie Sambor. And he's one of my closest friends. And so, I, and Richie was in Bon Jovi at the time. And I said, Richie, you know, I, you know, I'm involved with this thing, this charity and told him what it was about. And I said, would you be willing to play to help raise money for the Midnight Mission? I was waiting for him to say, you know, Norm, I'm real busy. I don't really have time. He goes, yeah, let's do it. You know, and I, uh. really? So the first concert we did was Richie, uh, Los Lobos, Jackson Brown, Sky Lawrence Juber, great guitar player, played for yeah, the Wings. Yeah. Uh, his daughter, Ilse Juber, who's a very talented uh, musician. And then uh, the second one was uh, with Ario Speedwagon, Unplugged, John Mayall, and uh, a couple other acts. And then um, the third one was Tom Petty. And wow. Tom became very involved with the Midnight Mission. And they actually gave him an award, uh, you know, because, I mean, he was so involved and he loved it. And he knew, you know, being a musician, you're like, you know, one step away from being homeless. I mean, you yeah. know, if he didn't get the uh, the breaks that he got, he could have easily been, you know, just one of those people. So, uh, you know, he was a type A personality, a hard worker, and he stuck with it. And he was very talented and, you know, and he wrote, great songs. I really love the Heartbreakers. And I actually played in a band with Ron Blair, his bass player, before he was in the Heartbreakers for about two years. And then Ron joined the Heartbreakers. And uh, that was that then. Yeah. What a, kind, what a nice, you talk about that a lot in the book. It was very moving how you talked about it. So you did justice to them, to you and your uh, efforts towards them. Man. Well, I mean, it's like if you're able to do something, why wouldn't you? I mean, you know, I think that, you know, it's, you know, not everybody has a platform or not everybody has the ability to kind of organize stuff for a good cause. And as you get older, you start realizing that, you know, you know, you, you work all your life for something and you want to do something that's just for the good of, of people that are less fortunate. So it, it really means a lot to me and I'm still very involved with them. And we're always, you know, Gibson just gave us two guitars, um, really nice guitars, um, Les Paul Customs from the custom shop that we just had uh, Joe Bonamassa and Orianthe sign and we're gonna auction them off uh, to raise money for the Midnight Mission. That's good. So you're yeah. act, you you actively involved as much as, you, you know, throughout the Always. year, it's not just a Christmas yeah. thing now. Oh, yeah. No, no. Now, I, I mean, once I saw it and I've been down there seeing what they do and what I really liked about this particular place was, you know, a lot of a lot of these, there are a number of missions in L.A. and uh, most of them have like a religious component. So before they give you the sandwich and they give you a place to stay and maybe, you know, some clothes or whatever. They try to indoctrinate you into something, you know, this place doesn't have that, you know, they're not, you know, they're not, they have nothing to sell. They're, There's no they're, agenda. Right. Yeah. That's I, I, I don't like that. I feel uncomfortable with those, those first ones. Yeah. You know, I well. mean, nothing against it. I mean, they're no. still doing good stuff, but totally. this to me meant that it was, strictly for the good of the people and yeah not, uh you know not for any other reason i just want to ask you a few more questions and i can't thank you enough for your time oh it's um, my pleasure 
tell me. And, and thank you for thinking of us. You know, so. Oh, man. I was so happy when Dave uh, connected us because I knew you'd have some good stories. Well, Dave so. is one of the great guys. I, I've got some funny Dave. Amato tell me some funny. Well, well, let me ask I, you one question. Dave said that you should have a wing in your house named after him. Is that true? Uh, probably. You know, I've got the Richie <laughs> Sabor wing. wing. I have the Amato wing, you know, so he's been a victim. I mean, a customer for many, many years. He's but we used, awesome to love to guy, play, we used to love to play tricks on Dave, you know, when he came in. And I remember one time in my old store, and by the way, Dave brought in a lot of people. He introduced me to Richie Sambor. You talk about that in your book, which I thought he, was very cool. Yeah, so many other people, Aerosmith, he brought in and all that, you know, so he really was like one of our biggest advocates. But we, I went to Disneyland, and they had a thing where it was like a leash, and uh, there was nothing on the end, it was like there was a muzzle, but there was nothing in it. And they had four noises that you would press these buttons, one was a cow, one was a chicken, one was a dog, and one was a cat. So Amato comes into the store and we he's standing by this back wall of the store and we had this rigged up. So it sounded like there was a cat in our wall. So, um, so he's a big standing, cat lover. Yeah. Well, he loves animals. He's just a good guy. He's a sweetheart yeah. of a guy, you know? So, um, so he's standing by the back wall and we press cat. He goes, meow. And Dave does one of these and we don't say anything. And then you go know, press it again. Meow. He goes, sounds like a cat. What's going on? And Danny, who used to work for me, he goes, yeah, some cat. He's stuck in the wall. He'll be dead. You know I mean? You know, it's like, you know, he can't go much longer, you know? And Dave's going, what do you mean? There's a cat stuck in your wall. You know, he said, he's been there for weeks. It's, you know, you know, it's, it's not going to be long now. And he does it another couple of times. And Dave's like losing his mind. And then we press the cow and the chicken noise. <laughs> and then he goes, you fucking guys, you know, then he realized that oh, we were goofing on him, you know, That's so, funny. He, uh, he actually told me that story. He, he was, he thought it was hilarious. It was really, yeah. Oh, yeah. it was really uh, priceless. I wish <laughs> we would have had that on video because he was so upset. I mean, you know, man, don't worry about it. It's going to be yeah. another few days, you know, <laughs> That's funny as hell. Uh, Norm, tell me, what do you like most about yourself? Not a whole lot. I mean, no, you know, no I mean, no, seriously. I mean, that, you know, I try. And I mean, you know, I, I like that I work hard. You know, I think that's, you know, a good quality and all that. But, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, I think of myself as kind of a male, you know, I mean, I just kind of, you know, I, you know, I've just kind of been in the right place. I mean, people, you know, call and they go, well, thanks for what you're doing for the guitar community. You know, we, we introduce a lot of young uh, talent through our videos. You know, we have a huge following. Uh, not yet. Um, uh, you, sorry about that. No, it's all uh, good. Yeah, you want to, uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, we, we try to introduce a lot of young talent and sometimes some of these uh, journeyman acts that really, you know, they need some exposure <clears throat> to promote their new record if they have a record or just some concerts that they're playing and they have no other way to really, you know, get, so, you know, I'm always like, you know, I don't, you know, I don't think what we're doing is really a big deal. I think anybody could do it. But I, I think it does have an effect. And sure. so I, I'm glad we're able to, you know, help some of these people out a bit, you know, with, um, you know, promoting whatever they're promoting. Do you have any hobbies outside of your business and music? Well, uh, one that I really shouldn't do is play poker. I'm getting better at it. <laughs> if I ever get even, I'll never play. Again. Uh, that's your quest to get even. It's been a very long <laughs> journey to try to break even. Tell me the uh, toughest decision you've ever had to make or most difficult thing you've had to do. Um, you know, in business, there's always, you know, some tough decisions where, you know, sometimes you don't buy an instrument that you really should have bought. Or, I, I mean, I had a situation where George Harrison wanted to trade me one of his Gretsch guitars. And he was the first really big star that I ever dealt with. And I just kind of was going, nobody's going to believe that I was with a Beatle. I mean, the Beatles were like, you know, so big, you know, that it was like, um, I just didn't think that anybody would believe me and they called me a liar. So I didn't take it in. Now, looking back at it, I probably, it was probably a million dollar mistake or more, uh, you know, but 
to live and learn. But it's a lifetime of things like that, though. You, I mean, you, it's like impossible to make every right decision. Well, of course. And, yeah. you know, a lot of it is based on, you know, I at the time that we were dealing, um, there's a whole story and it's in my book and all yeah. that. It's about um, uh, George had a guitar stolen from him. It was a red Les Paul that Clapton gave him. It was sold in a store in Hollywood. And this was before I had a store. I was just buying and selling guitars and running around. And they went into a friend of mine's store in West LA and were saying, listen, we got a hold of the guy who bought the guitar. He's willing to give it back to George, but he wants a late 50s Les Paul standard to replace it because he bought it in good faith in this other store. This guy had bought, you know, the guitar. So they contacted him. He's willing to give it back to George. So they needed to find a late 50s standard. So they went into this other friend of mine's store. And this is before I even owned a store. And my friend says, well, I know a guy's got like three of them. But, um, and that was me. And I was yeah. living in an apartment in Sherman Oaks, you know, and uh, uh I, I'll tell you the story. I'll try to make it brief. So no, um, no, t- t- uh, make it fun. All right. So, um, so my friend who had the store university music calls me up and he goes, I've got a very special customer and um, you need to come down. It was like a Saturday morning at like nine o'clock or something. He calls me and, you know, I go, well, well tell me what's going on. He says, I, I can't tell you, but it's really important. You got to come down here. And I was kind of hemming and hawing and all that. And he goes, I'm telling you, Norman, you got to come down here. So I jump in my car, I go down. It was, you know, probably a 30, 40 minute drive. And I come in and it's my friend Dale who owns this music store. And he's just sitting there by himself. And I go, Dale, what's the deal? I mean, I just drove down here like it was an emergency. He said, well, it's George Harrison. And he's trying to get a late 50s Les Paul Standard to exchange to get his red guitar back. That was clap, the guitar Clapton gave him. I said, yes, yeah, so where is he? And Dale goes, he's just over there getting a slice of pizza next door. <laughs> and as <laughs> he said that, the door opens and George and Mal Evans, who was a Beatle, Beatles road manager come walking through the door. You know, I'm look, looking at, you know, I, I can hardly believe, I mean, you know, the Beatles were like, so, I mean, it was like the Pope, the president, yeah. and, you know, and everybody else all at once rolled into one, you know, I mean, you never would think you'd ever meet a Beatle, you know? So, um, you know, I'm looking at him and uh, my friend Dale says, you know, he has an apartment and he's got like three of them over there. So we get in my car and we drive to uh, this apartment in Sherman Oaks. Were you nervous having George in the back? Yeah. And I'm looking at him like, this has got to be like uh, an imposter or, you know, I mean, you know, right. it's just, you know, it's just hard to believe I'm sitting right next to him and I keep looking at him. So we go to, uh, to my apartment and there was like an underground parking lot. We come up through this uh, stairway and we come up and there's like a, atrium there you know and um a few people see us walking into my apartment so um we go in we negotiate and, you know oh and marlene is in her bathroom my wife's in her bathroom <laughs> i said george harrison's coming in she goes yeah right and i go no i and as I say that, he comes walking in with Mal, and, uh, and my wife is like in shock, you know. And uh, I ended up making a deal with him on it. He bought two Sunburst Les Balls, one to trade to get his guitar back, and then he bought a 56 Strat and another 60 uh, Les Ball Standard. And um, we walk out of the apartment building, and now there's like 100 people or something standing there because somebody spotted a Beetle coming into our apartment building, you know, and just in the like, blink of an eye that it took to oh, do that. It was like no time at all, you know? And, uh, so, I mean, you know, again, that's like, uh, you know, if the president or whoever would yeah, be, yeah. came walking into your place, you know, and, and it was easy to recognize at the time. This was had to be like maybe 1974 or something. I'm not sure. No, maybe even earlier. It was like when all things must pass, you know, mm. George had a solo. Great so reference. I think it was earlier, maybe 71 or something. So, um, but the Beatles were like God. I mean, it was, you know, you know, nobody could believe that a Beatle was there. So, um, you know, a funny 
turnaround to the story is about two years ago, a lady comes into my store now and says, hey, Norm, how you doing? I don't know if you remember me, but I lived in this apartment building with you. Um, you know, it was myself and my sister and my mom. And we, lived, we were little girls at the time. And um, her mom knew Marlene, my wife, a little bit, you know, from the building. And um, she said, by the way, um, you know, everybody was crazy about this story when you had George Harrison in there. And I said, oh, yeah, cool. She goes, yeah, and my sister is Paula Abdul. You know what? You talked about that in the book. It was so nice. Uh, well, you know, in L.A., you just don't know who you might be living yeah. in. Mean, they were just young girls. They might have been eight years old or something. But it was the talk of the building for a long time that we had a beetle in the building. That's so, so cool. Yeah. So, you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, again, there's so many, there's so many stories and so many things over oh, when you do something for 50 years. And I'm in the hub of the entertainment business right out here. So just being in the right place at the right time, and just things have just fallen into place. I worked hard, but there was a lot of luck involved. Sure. T tell me the uh, what's been the biggest change in you, your personality, maybe over the last 10 years? And has that change been intentional or is that just a part of aging? Well, you know, I'm getting older, but I mean, I had to be kind of convinced of the social media thing. Cause I really, I, I liked, I was kind of old school. I like shaking somebody's hand and doing business face to face. And, you know, it's, for me, it was awkward and I really tried to resist it as much as I could, but now we're, you know, I mean, very much involved in social media, you know, our, our, between our YouTube and Facebook and Instagram, we have like a million one followers, you know? So, I mean, you know, well We've deserved. Very lucky. Yeah. Well, just very lucky. So, I mean, I've had to kind of get myself accustomed to that. I mean, you know, when we do the videos, I mean, I was always very self conscious about talking, you know, in public and that kind of thing. It, you know, it's one thing. Really, talking face even to face. with your as much as you talk with people. Yeah, but you know, when you talk to a crowd and it's a bunch of people and you don't know what they're thinking and you know. It, you know, I just, I was just nervous. Even hmm. when I used to play music with my band, I was not the spokesperson in the band. I mean, there were other guys that would like to speak. I just didn't feel comfortable doing it. That's something that I've gotten more used to over the years, you know, so, but it wasn't something that I really chose to do originally. Yeah. You know, now I'm comfortable with it. And I, you know, I figure at my age, you know, what are they going to do? Give me a life sentence? Right. How long could that be at my <laughs> age? <laughs> oh, man. Last question. Any final words of wisdom? And I thank you again. No, I think just, you know, to anybody young, find something that you love doing and then it won't be difficult working hard at it. If you hate what you do, it's very difficult to be successful at it. But if you love what you do, um, I think you'll find a way. Uh, I want to thank you very much for everything. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, you Thank have you, a Greg. great Appreciate story, it. man. It was so nice to hear it, you know, to read about it and then hear you share it, man. You're like all the hard work. I have so much respect for you. I would love everybody to check out the book Confessions of a Vintage Guitar Deal. It's a very fun read. Like you could sit out with a cigar or whatever it is you do and cup of coffee over a Saturday and like enjoy it for the afternoon. I, I uh, always like to say that I need an illiterary agent. You, you know? need an Ill No, it's a very, it's a lovely book, it's, man. It's, it's, it's you know, it's easy reading and yeah. I, I wanted it to be for people who don't have a lot, a large attention span, you know, yeah. the chapters are short. The story is kind of, you know, to what? The point, you know? it was, it was really cool that it was little chopped up stories, you know, cause sometimes you read a bio. I mean, like I love Jeff Beck, but man, I still have his 600 page book sitting there. Like, yeah. you know, it's just kind of tough to, to get the time to get through that midnight mission. Where do people go if they want to check out the midnight mission to learn more about? Well, it? there's a midnight mission there on, uh, San Pedro Street, downtown okay. Los Angeles. Um, I don't have the information here handy. No, that's fine. I could get that to you. But uh, they're great. And, uh, and I have to say, we have had so many people that are you know, our customers and our friends and our family in here. I like to call them all our family. I mean, even, you know, Joe Bonamassa has played a couple of times for the Midnight Mission. I mean, we have so many people that are, you know, really, once they see what they do, They've really gotten behind it. And uh, Richie Sambora, again, Tom Petty would love the Midnight Mission. Um, you know, you ever want to do something in Tom Petty's name, 
he would love that. You know? The Midnight so, Mission. Uh, yeah. And I'm sure they're online as well? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So check out Midnight Mission online if you're not in L.A. Uh, Confessions of a Vintage Guitar Dealer by Norm Harrison. Also, uh, pay attention. I'm assuming you'd have it on all your socials when the documentary comes out. Yeah, we're, you know, they haven't sold it yet. They're still in the final stages of editing the thing. There is a lot of information. And I think it's it's done really well. So it's not like just an advertisement for us. So um, I hope people like it. I mean, I'm sure they will, stories. man. You got some good stories. Thank you. Thank you. Hang on one second. We'll wrap up. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, share it on your socials with your friends. Uh, thanks very much to Norm Havers for spending time with us. Again, Confessions of a Vintage Guitar Dealer, The Midnight Mission, and stay tuned for the documentary. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. Norm, thank you for everything, brother.